Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Do I sound like I'm in a tunnel? A little bit? We'll figure that out in a moment. It is so nice to see all you here tonight, man. We had a great, absolutely great day on Sunday. Um, I got here late today. I'm just going to let you know. I've been sick since Monday. I've been out. I have been down. Uh, but I'm here tonight. I snuck in late uh, to try and minimize contact with anybody. I do not want you to get what I have. So when I'm through here tonight, I'm going to right out the side door and I'm going to go home and go back to bed. But I came out for tonight. It's going to be a great night. We have a great word to, to get into tonight. I say this often, but this is one of my favorite chapters. First Samuel chapter 8. If you'll open up your Bibles to First Samuel chapter 8. The title of our message tonight is called My Way or Yahweh. <laughs> My way or Yahweh. Let's begin in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this night. Lord, I pray that as we get into your word tonight, Lord, first and foremost, I pray that my voice will hold out to the end. I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us once again through your word, Lord, that you will shine your truth, Lord, into our hearts and on our minds. I pray, Lord, that we would once again, Lord, be filled up with your word this week, that we would be cleansed, Lord, that we would be enriched and we'd be filled with the bread of life. We thank you, Lord God. I pray, Lord, you speak through me tonight to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, as I was studying this chapter tonight, this title kind of tells you where we're going. I was reminded several times in my life where I had gone out on my own or maybe got ahead of God. You ever wanted something so bad that you constantly pray to God for it and then you get it? And it ends up sort of being a disaster. You find out that it was more your will than God's will. Right after Robin and I got married, when we were young, uh, we were serving in a church, and things were going well in our lives. And I had always dreamed of ha owning property uh, in the town that I grew up in, Elma, Washington. I loved to hunt. I loved to fish. I loved to live in the country. I grew up in the country um, at my folks' place. And, and I always wanted to own a big piece of property and be able to have my own place to go out into the woods. So after we got married, I kind of figured it was time for us to move on this plan. And we looked around, and many of you remember the real estate crash of 2008, right? That was kind of the big crash that sent everything through the roof. Before that, things were getting just crazy expensive. But you fast forward a few years, the same places that were selling for a half a million dollars were now selling for 250, right? And prior to 2008, Robin and I, well, I had looked at property on this road. It's called Hokanson Road. It was about five miles out from the one stoplight we had in town. And it was just beautiful. There was a house, big porch, uh, sat up on a hill, had you know, lots of grass around. It was about five acres. And I wanted it, but it was so expensive, and I couldn't really afford it. And I was so disappointed. I remember praying to the Lord, and I was kind of disappointed I didn't get it. And when we were looking for property, we found another piece of property on this road. It was towards the end of the road, which was even better, because at the end of the road, it just turned into a dirt gravel road that went up into the woods. It's a logging road that you could access uh, for hunting and everything. So this place came for sale at the end of it. It was 20 acres. It had a custom log home built on it. I was told that uh, the guy that built it was a, um, uh, an oil executive for one of the major oil companies. And he actually built it for a hunting cabin. Uh, but it was like 2,000 square feet, or close to it. I can't remember exactly what it was. He actually flew Amish people in to build it without tools. They logged the property and used the logs on the property to build the house. And I mean, it was, it was the nicest hunting lodge you, or hunting cabin anyone could build for themselves. Well, the place that, was, that I wanted before was already sold. That was already gone. This place was selling for less than what I originally wanted to, was going to pay for the one before, and I had more money now. I'd been working for the fire department longer and I had better access. It was still quite a bit at the top of our price range. And we prayed, and we prayed, but I think my prayers were more or less, God, I want this place. I need you to help me get it, right? Well, as we were moving through the closing process, we made an offer. It was accepted. It was well below what they were asking. Uh, I, I had come, through the, come to knowledge that uh, the man who had it built had passed away. 
His son was a lawyer uh, in, in LA. He had a daughter that was a doctor in New York, and they just wanted the place gone. They wanted to get the money from it. They didn't want to deal with it anymore, and so uh, they were liquidating his assets. So I kind of came in at the perfect time, made an offer. It was accepted. We started moving through the process, and the day that we went to sign the papers to close, and I mean, if you bought a house and you've got a loan, you know all of the hoops you got to jump through to get to that point. The day that we were on our way to close the property, I got a call, and they told me that the lender just backed out. I mean. It's, we're signing papers at 12.30, it's like 12.15. And I'm like, how could we, for 30 days, they made me write a letter explaining why I bounced a check two years ago. Like, how did they just decide that they're not gonna do this 15 minutes before I'm gonna sign? So I was, I was upset, the realtor said, you know what? We asked for an extension, we go back, and we get you know, a, a different lender. I like, okay. And we got a different lender. And then it was challenging to find insurance because of the spe you know, specifications they had for insurance companies. And this place had a metal roof and Washington State doesn't, you know, log homes aren't very popular there. So there was all these challenges and things we had to overcome. And the day that we were set to close, we were driving there and Robin was in front of me in her car and I was behind her in my pickup truck. And I saw a glint of something come off of the log truck. The glint that I saw was a big chunk of steel that fell off of his truck, hit the road, bounced up, and smacked my wife's car. And she pulled over, and, and, and you know, she gets there, and, you know, and, and, you know, for me, I'm just like, it's been 60 days, we've already fallen through one time, come hell or high water, we're getting there to sign on this place, right? I had fallen in love with this house, I, we were gonna get it. Well, we signed papers on it, and we got my dream. It was my dream to have this place, beautiful place. 20 acres, custom log home, pond in the back right off the back porch with fish in it. I could literally fish from my back porch. It was so beautiful. I had all my friends over to shoot guns in the front yard. It was the best time ever. <laughs> but a year later, I got into the ministry. And the more I began to serve God, the less I cared about wearing uniform, having a job, and things like that. I really wanted to serve the Lord more often, and I felt the Lord was calling me to full-time ministry. The problem is now, I had this massive house payment. I couldn't quit. When the Lord was calling us away the first time, I believe, me and Robin were going to go on the road, and we were going to uh, do music, and we were going to have a special message for churches, and this was our plan, and this is what we were going to go out and do. And so we put the house up for sale, and we got all the way to closing, and uh, they did an inspection on the house, and everything was good, except for they found one bit of rot on the back where the gutter had come un undone, and it dripped water down the logs, and it did it for long enough, it, it, it rotted out this little corner. Killed the whole sale. I was so tore up that God didn't just help us sell the house. This place, while there were many good memories, and it was a wonderful place to be, was my will, and it prevented me from walking in what God had for us because I charged through, I forced through. Have you ever done that? Or is it just me? You never set off on your own and tried to get God to bless your plan? Well, the Israelites, strangely enough, did just that. Let's read here in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. I wish my voice stayed this deep all the time. <laughs> it, it makes everything I say like sound more important, you know? <laughs> like this is the Rock Calvary Chapel narrated by James Earl Jones, you know? <laughs> I'm listening to myself and I'm like, I don't even sound like me, but I kind of like this new sound. <laughs> All right, um, let's, let's get into the word. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. <laughs> Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Samuel, by all accounts, was a very, very godly man. In fact, throughout the scriptures, he would be up there at the top. Abraham, David, you could put this guy alongside any of the godly men in the Bible. There's nowhere that we, that we read that, he, that God specifically came and condemned him for any sort of action that he did. But here, we see that he did sin. He wasn't a perfect man. 
What was a sin? Well, first of all, he made his sons judges. There's nowhere else in scripture that we see judges being passed down through the family. Judges were always called upon. They were raised up by God specifically for a specific purpose and usually for a specific time. When they tried to make Gideon a judge, Gideon, he refused. He said, no, no, no. Or rather, they were going to try and make him a king. He said, no, that's not what God called me to do. This is not what we're, you know, we're not going to go down that road. The judges were raised up by God for a specific purpose and for a specific time. He put his sons in charge of being judges. He passed it down to them. And why was this so sinful? Number one, God didn't raise them up. God didn't tell him to do this. But number two, they weren't fit to do this. Because we read here in verse three, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes and they perverted justice. It almost kind of seems like there's a pattern developing with judges because the last judge had the same issue. Great judge, bad dad. They were not parenting their, their, their children did not walk in the same ways. They didn't follow the Lord. They didn't teach them the things of the Lord. Or they did, perhaps. We don't know that for sure. Uh, sons certainly made their own choices. Um, but dad probably should have known that these guys were not supposed to be judges. And he made them judges, so that was wrong. But this leads to another problem. Verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, look, you are old. I'm, I'm sure that was easy to hear. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now the people were right to come to Samuel and say, we can't accept your sons as judges. These guys, they were perverting justice. They were receiving bribes. Now a judge was a judge in the traditional sense of the word that we would think of a judge. If we had a matter, if we had a dispute of some kind, when the judges came, we may go to Ramah to see the judge there. We could go to Beersheba to see the judges there. And you sort of take your court matter, and he will decide between the two using the wisdom that God has given him, using the word of God. This is what judges were for. Now, how disheartening would it be if you went to a judge and, and you could win your case simply by paying him? Now, you know, if you're falsely accused of something, that might be kind of, you know, convenient, right? But what if someone falsely accused you and then paid the judge to make you guilty? I mean, that would be horrible. That's perverting justice. This was given a horrible name uh, to, to both, uh, you know, God's workers and God himself. The people just, they were right to come to Samuel and say, listen, we reject this kind of leadership. However, some of the things they said to him might have been kind of hard to hear, but their solution takes it a step further and is wrong as well. It says... Uh, your sons don't walk in your ways, verse 5. He says, but make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Here we see one of the very first things that you should do when you're making big decisions in life. The first thing you should do is allow the Lord to make the decision. Look at what they did. When they come to Samuel, they say, make us a king to judge us like who? Like all the nations. Where were their eyes at? Where were they looking? Nowhere do we, do we hear them coming to the Lord saying, Lord, what do you want for us? What, what do you think? Should we have another judge? His sons are being referring justice. Should they be our judges? Should we have another judge? Lord, is it you? Should we have a king? You know what's really interesting about this? God knew this was going to happen hundreds of years before it actually did. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Let's read what... Uh, let's read what Moses writes here in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Because it's very interesting as we come up to this transition phase that they're getting into. Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 17, verse 14. Listen to what he writes. This is the Lord speaking. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. Notice who's doing the choosing. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you that you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall multiply, excuse me, he shall not multiply horses for himself. Uh, later on, this is going to get broken. Uh, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. I wish Solomon would have read this line. Between his wives and concubines, he had a thousand women at his disposal. 
and they turned his heart away. He spent the rest of his life serving false gods. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Again, Solomon could have read that. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of the law in the book and, uh, uh, from one before the priests and the Levites. Now, he goes on to basically say, as a king, this is the way a king should act. First of all, he shouldn't have a bunch of horses, don't have a bunch of wives, and don't get rich off the people. And, by the way, do your Bible studies. Stay in your devotions. Now, what's interesting about that passage is this both shows that God knew that when they came into the land, this was going to be a request. He says, you're going to ask for a king to judge you, just like all the other nations. God knew this was going to happen. And when it does happen, this is the way a king is supposed to act. God gave the guidelines for the kings. Now, all this is going to get thrown away, but this doesn't negate the fact that the motivation behind the people asking for this was that they wanted to be like the rest of the world. They didn't ask God. They didn't take it before God. They came up with a solution, and then they asked him to reinforce their plan. They said, God, what we need you to do is make this happen. We want a king to judge us like all the race. You know what they were doing? They were just simply coming up with their own will and asking God to, 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 to make it happen. They didn't ask the Lord for direction. This is, what, this is exactly the opposite of what you should do. When you're faced with a big decision in life, where to live, where to go, what, to, what school to go to, should I take this job, should I not take this job, first thing you should do is go to the Lord with it. Ask him for direction. Too often, people look to the world. Too often, Christians want to look like the world. God did never call you to be the world. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, literally, from this world, right, by the renewing of your mind, by the reading of God's word. When you get into God's word, this thing changes you. The first thing you should do is go to the Lord with your plan or ask him for the plan. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That is an if-then promise. If you do this, I will do this. How do, you, how do you make your plan? How do you know where God wants you to be? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understandings. When you look to the world, that's leaning on your own understandings. I tell you what, if I had a nickel for every time I got an email from somebody trying to sell me a program to build the church using a model based upon business or the world, I could buy us all a very fancy lunch. I get these things all the time. Business owner, business CEO from Walmart wants to show you how to grow the church in three easy steps. I'm like, I, you know where the best model for growing a church is? The book of Acts. Yeah. God gave us the pattern already. We don't need Walmart to teach us how to, you know, do this with lower prices. <laughs> God's already given us the model. We just simply have to follow this. That's it. Matthew chapter 6, uh, uh, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If it's a matter of needing something, a job, uh, clothes, food, money, whatever it is, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Don't confuse going to the Lord with your plan with seeking God's direction. Come to him openly and ask him what to do. All right, chapter uh, 8, verse 6. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to do. For they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me, that I should reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, for which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. Samuel is displeased by this, <clears throat> and I can imagine why. First of all, they call him old. <laughs> Not a great way to start off a conversation. Hey, pastor, I just want to get this out of the way. You're old. We'd like to have somebody else. You know, that's kind of what they said, you know. Probably wasn't easy for him to hear that his sons weren't doing well in the ministry. These things probably bothered him. But I, I would suggest what really bothered him is that the people came and wanted to be like the rest of the world. The motivation behind their request probably bothered him a great deal. So he does what we should all do. He took it to the Lord in prayer. 
He went straight to God. Oh, what needless pain we bear because we do not take it to the Lord in prayer. What do we do when something bothers us? Think about it. Talk to people. Stew on it. Worry. That's my go-to. That's my go-to. I worry. And worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you never get anywhere. What needless pain we bear because we do not take it to the Lord in prayer. Samuel took it to the Lord. It's interesting what the Lord responds. He says, heed the voice of the people and all that they say to do. For they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me, that I should reign over them. That's an interesting statement. First of all, he's saying to Samuel, Samuel, hey, listen, don't take it personal. They're making it personal. You know, they're saying that you're, you know, you can't, you know, they're rejecting because of the son. But perhaps Samuel even felt a little bit of guilt knowing that he made his son's judges and that they weren't ready for it and they were, they were messing up and things weren't going well in the ministry. But I would say probably more than anything, Samuel would be like, wait, are you kidding me? I've, I've been, I've, since I've been a judge, this place has experienced the greatest revival that, nearly that we've ever had. God has never failed us. In fact, in chapter 7, they just had a great victory over a Philistine army that was much bigger, much well, more, better equipped. God defeated them with thunder. These great things have happened. Now a little time has passed, and it's like the people have come to him and said, hey, you know what? God's been good and all, but uh, you know, I think we need to go in a different direction. What's, what's really going to solve our problems is a king. God, you know what? You've been great. We love your leadership. You know, it's not you, it's us. I mean, how did this conversation, how did they arrive to this? God has always been good. For 400 years, God has been their king. What better king could you have than God? Now, for Samuel, Samuel takes it a little bit personal. And I'll be honest, as a pastor, it's, it's hard not to. Sometimes people have an issue with what the word says, and they come and they, they bring it to me, and then, you know, I, I explain the word as best I can. And sometimes it's quite clear they're just not going to accept the word. But they don't ever really reject the Bible, and they don't reject God. What they do is they reject me, and they make it personal. And it's hard. Just like I can, I like, I listen to this, and I look at that, and I'm like, yeah, Samuel, I, hey, man, I get it. But one thing Samuel needs to be reminded of, and me as well, it's like, well, look, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. You know, God is well acquainted with being rejected, isn't he? 2,000 years later, another king is going to be hanging from a cross. And the same people that cried out, Hosanna, the same crowd that waved the palm branches and said, you are the greatest thing ever, was screaming out, crucify him. The same people. No different. He was despised and rejected, Isaiah 53 tells us. He's been rejected. God knows what this is. They're not rejecting Samuel. What they think is going to solve all their issues is government and politicians. My goodness, they're in for it, aren't they? This is, this is one of the funnier requests in the Bible. I don't want God to reign over me. What I really want is a Democratic and Republican Party. That's what I want. Yeah. It's going to work out well. So God says to them, verse 8, according to all the works which they've done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they've forsaken me and served other gods, so they're doing now. God alludes to the real heart and the root of this issue. It wasn't his leadership. It's that the people made themselves gods. They were, they were wanting to serve themselves. This is the second thing you need to do if you're going to make a big decision in life. Once you have prayed and you've asked the Lord for direction, whatever it is that you think God might be leading you to do needs to line up with the word of God. They came with their request, and their request didn't line up with the word of God. Perhaps even from Deuteronomy, you could surmise that it was God's will to give them a king. Their motivation wasn't to have the king that God had for them. Their motivation was to request a king so they'd be like the rest of the nations. They wanted to be like the people around them. Just like uh, a child, you might think. I want a dog, because all my friends have dogs. You know, I want a boyfriend, because all my friends have boyfriends. 
As an adult, I want that truck because all my friends have that truck, you know. I want to wear bell bottoms because all my friends wear bell bottoms. <laughs> yeah, some people did that. Mm -hmm. G gave yourself away there, yeah, I'll tell you what. But what they were doing wasn't lining up with the word of God. This was not God's will for their life. And I hear people often, I hear people often, well, God must want me to be with that guy because he brought him into my life and he's been so nice and he loves the Lord. Yeah, but that guy's married. And the word says not to do that. Well, everybody else in the world is doing it though, right? Ah, you know, I, I know that God says that we shouldn't live together before marriage, but, you know, Oprah's Brooks said that it's really important to do that to cultivate a good marriage. Ah, I'm sure the world says that. The problem is, is that goes against the word of God. Right? I mean, you can just, you can point to any arrow on the compass. Whatever the world says is okay, usually goes against the word of God. In fact, I said usually, always goes against the word of God because the word of God and the world are always at opposite ends. There's what God says to do, and there's what God says not to do. And whenever we do what he says not to do, it always brings consequences into our life. Always. It brings hardship. And sometimes God will give you the desire of your heart just to show you that that's not what you really needed and to teach you through this. It's interesting that God says, give it to them. Give it to them. It's almost indicating that he knows that they're not going to change their mind. So he's going to give them a king. There's going to be a king that he chooses, but it's going to be according to their desire. The king they get first, it's not going to go so well. The king that he gives them is going to come after that. That's going to go much better, but not perfect. So in verse 9, he says, Now therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of a king who will reign over them. <laughs> now he's going to teach them. Verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, This will be the behavior of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his, uh, his horsemen. And some will run before the chariots. Now, what did God say in Deuteronomy not to, not to have? It's horses. Interesting, isn't it? Samuel knows what these kings are going to do. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap the harvest and some to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. If you're going to make a decision, you're going to make an informed decision, Israel. This is what a king is going to do. Notice, notice the, the, the repetitive word there. He will take. He will take. He will take. He will take. Kings aren't givers. Governments aren't givers, are they? You could say he will take and replace that with he will tax. He will tax. He will tax. You guys just pay your taxes? Yeah. Me too. He will take. Notice this at the end with it. He says, he will take, he will take, he will take, and you will be his servants. And he makes known to them that this is your king whom you have chosen. Now, ultimately, God's going to choose who it is. But this was their choice. This is what he wants them to know. This is what's going to happen if you get this. It's not going to be what you think it will. It may solve some of the issues you think it's going to solve, but it's going to bring with it long-term consequences. And it's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. Try and talk a little girl out of having an animal pet. I tried that once. Right? I said, you know what, honey? It's a lot of work. I know, Dad. 
you know what? You're going to have to buy stuff for it. It means you're going to have to work. You're going to have to work in the house to get money to buy this stuff. I know, Dad. Okay, well, you're going to have to play with them. I know, Dad. I know. I know. I know. And I'm like, child, you're not listening to a thing Daddy's telling you. What happens? We get to guinea pigs. We get to guinea pigs. I don't know why God made guinea pigs. I have no idea what purpose they serve on this earth. They don't do anything. They got the same look on their face, whether they're happy, sad, scared, or mad. They squeak and fall off of things. And they eat. And you wouldn't believe the boo-hooing when she found out that I was serious, that you have to pay for things. Oh, I, I, well, that, I earned that money. Yeah, <laughs> you wanted the pet, right? Not, not exactly, oh, you gotta clean out the cage too. Yeah, but it smells bad. Yeah, I realize that, that's why it needs to get cleaned, right? Finds out later there's responsibility with it. Now that's a cheeky story to, to display this. They're gonna get their king. It's not gonna solve the issues. There's gonna be a lot of unintended consequences that come along with this request. And this is what God is trying to warn them for. Have you ever made a decision and you feel like there's an awful lot of things trying to stop it? Remember the story I told you in the beginning? How a, a bank backs out 15 minutes before you're supposed to sign, and then the next time you go to sign, a big metal part randomly flies off a truck and hits your wife's car on the way to the signing? You'd have thought at that point, I'd have stopped and thought, huh, it's almost like something's trying to stop me from buying this house. Not when you're young and you want something. The word of God is a decision that we make to live by it. Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word is living and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Goes right down to the division of soul and spirit. Gets right down to the heart of the matter. 2 Timothy 3.6 says all scripture is inspired by God. That is good for reproof, for, uh, for, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You build your life off the word of God. When God says to do something, it will line up with the word of God. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not God. And my goodness gracious, if you're not sure, and you're praying, and you're putting your, trace, your trust in, in the Lord, you're, you're acknowledging him in all the things that you're doing, you're not leaning on your own understandings, and you're trusting him to, direct, to guide your paths, my goodness gracious, heed the warning. Because God is fairly effective at letting you know to stop. Now this, I will say, this does get a little bit tricky. Because when you are walking in God's will, you do have an enemy. And there is something called a spiritual battle. In the spirit world, Satan has a plan for your life too, and it is a bad one, it's to destroy you. Satan's plan always tempts you to sin for short-term fulfillment that will bring long-term consequences. And this is what happens when we serve ourselves. It brings us into this place where sin keeps us a lot longer than we want to stay and takes us a lot further than we want to go. That's the problem with sin. God's word will always lead you to righteousness. You follow it. And when he's trying to warn you, heed the warning. Now, the question always is, how do you know if God is trying to stop you or if Satan's trying to hinder you? And I always say this, if you're walking in God's will, Satan will try and frustrate you and discourage you. That's, that's his primary tactic. It happens all the time. I see it all the time. He tries to tempt you away or he tries to discourage you from doing something, okay? And this can come in a lot of different forms, but I would say this. If you are acknowledging God and you're seeking the kingdom, you're not leaning on your own understandings. You, are, you are, are praying and asking the Lord for direction, and it lines up with the word of God. Chances are Satan's trying to hinder you from it. Okay? If you have prayed to God, you've had a plan, you're asking him to acknowledge it, it doesn't necessarily line up with the word of God, or there's some issue with it, and you keep running into problems, probably God trying to stop you from making a bad decision. So how do you discern this on your own? Well, I would go back to Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6. If you really don't know, God is effective at stopping you. You ask him, Lord, if this is not your will, slam that door shut. And maybe, maybe I'm extra foolish, so I need an extra big door, and I need a brick that says stop. 
And God is effective at doing that. He knows how to stop you. And maybe this is you. I know this is me. I know that sometimes I forge ahead with my plan and put my head down and say, I'm going to make this happen. And even then, I'll stop myself and say, wait, Lord, okay, I, I, I may have gotten ahead of you here. If I'm too far ahead, stop me, right? And I'm old enough now to know that when he does that, cool, I'm not going to be upset. When I was younger, it would frustrate me. But, but, but now it's like, okay, I've made enough mistakes that I don't want to get out of God's will anymore. I want to do what he wants me to do, right? But I will say this, man, if you're leaning on God and you're acknowledging him, and you are following him, man. I tell you what, he is, is, is fairly effective at opening doors that no man can open and closing doors that no man can close. Trust him. It involves trust and obedience. So the people heard how bad a king would be, and they decided, you know what, God, you're right. We're not going to do this. We're just going to go ahead and go with whatever you want. No. No, that's not what I did either. Listen to what verse 19 says. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, we'll have a king over us. They just heard about all the king was going to do. He's going to take your stuff. He's going to make you slaves. He's going to do all this kind of stuff. So what do you think about that? I know, Dad. <laughs> I want a king anyway. <laughs> Everybody else has got one. I want a king now. Samuel. Oh, this is what they, I'm sorry, they didn't finish that. It's in verse 20. It says that, they, that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. And I bet you he kicked over a couple of trash cans on the way there. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to his own city. So Samuel sent them away. In life, there are always going to be big decisions to make. How do you make them? When you don't know what to do, go to the Lord for direction. Ask him. Pour it out before the Lord. Make sure that whatever decision, whatever direction you feel led to go in, lines up with the word of God. Make sure it lines up with the word of God. And heed God's warnings. If he's trying to stop you, if you're not sure, talk to, a, talk to your friends who are spiritual. Go, go, to, go to a pastor, man. Lay it all out. Sometimes it's easier for somebody else to see the obvious than it is for yourself when you're walking through it. But if God's trying to stop you, my goodness, stop. Heed his warning. You do not want to be out of his will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, again for this word tonight. Lord, I thank you that you granted me the time and my voice held out the whole time. Lord, we thank you for last Sunday, that beautiful park that we had, and opportunity, Lord, to worship and study your word. And Father, we thank you for the people that you added to the kingdom on Sunday, the food, the fun. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we come together this Sunday, we're all well. We have plenty of parking, plenty of chairs. And Father, that once again, you will teach us and instruct us in righteousness. We pray these things, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. amen. And God bless you all. I'll see you Sunday with more to say.